Second, and third, I want to present a little bit this approach of social quality. A social quality perspective, going back to work now over, well, about 15 years ago, that mainly academics came together in the EU not being happy with the policies by the EU, by the institutions, saying there is policy, there is social policy in inverted commas, having effects on people's life, but there is no social competence, and whatever is understood as social policy is something that lacks a definition actually of what social is. It's just a perpetuation of whatever we know, and it is just a perpetuation of something that is traditionally linked to the process of production, to the economic process. Securing the status of labor force, of workers, uh, securing consumption, consuring, con uh, securing health and uh, child care, but not as a value in itself, but as value linked to the productive process. A little bit cynical, but only a little bit. We need to have the workforce, and uh, that's it. We are not really interested in the people, and we don't really want to know, this is the official understanding, more or less, we don't really want to know what it is about, what people are interested in, what is important for their daily life. Of course, the economy is important for daily life of people, of everybody, even of people who are not immediately part of the labor process. But at the same time, there is much more to it. I presented the definition before, and if we look at society in the way, in the light of this definition, we are confronted with two sets that are very important as defining criteria. The one, and the definition explicitly refers to this, is about relations. Whenever we look at social processes, it is about relations. People relating to each other, people relating to the environment, people in uh, groups relating to other groups, things like this. I said whenever we are looking at social processes, and this is one further criteria there, it is about processes. Social issues, societies, are never, ever static. It's about processes. You can see it already if you take the definition of relations. It can only be understood as matter of a process. It is not possible to relate to something or to somebody without being getting involved into a process. Going then to the next step, <clears throat> we are confronted with actors. A process always depends on some people acting. Now, of course, there is a behavior and you behave kind of instinctively, and this constitutes as well a process. But when we talk about policy making, it's much more important to say we are talking about actors, people acting, not, behave, not simply behaving, but consciously acting. And of course, acting in relationships means acting to other people, but as well to the environment. As said previously, it's the natural environment, but it is as well the physical, the built environment. We act within institutions, simplified. This is a human-made, man-made structure. Institutions, the most well-known institution is just the state, and the even more known institution, although not considered to be one, is the church. A traditional institution that provides values, that provides a framework for action and defines, in a way, relationships and processes, the flow of them. 
The actors are a little bit tricky because they have their own will. They have their own power of collectivizing, of linking together and going with the flow or going against it, distracting the direction or keeping it, distracting it to different directions, which means there are conflicts evolving from there. What we suggest is what is important if you look at social policy is actually not social policy in the traditional way, meaning looking for healthcare, looking for childcare, looking for the elderly, uh, looking for those who are excluded. But what is important is something else. It is every day, uh, people's everyday life. How do they gather? How do they live? How do they build up this social identity? How do they interact in their daily life? As I said, the economy, labor market issues are an important point there. And of course, health care, child care, other care is important there as well. Overcoming poverty, exclusion is something very important there as well. But we have to start not from these social problems in inverted commas, but on what kind of society are we actually looking at and how do we want to link with this in terms of policy making. We find these two basic tensions between biographical development and societal development. We have individuals, they want to act being knowing that they are part of something larger, part of society, but they want to, in, uh, to, to develop as individuals. And we have at the same time a societal development, depending on the biographical development, but being somewhat independent of it, because some people simply do not develop in the same way of uh, the society, society. And sometimes uh, societies develop in weird ways kind of independent of what actually people want, of what biographical development means. Then we have a second tension. People live together in relatively small entities. Take the classroom, and the classroom is actually a quite interesting point there. The classroom is people just being together more or less randomly thrown together because they have the same interest. There we are, the same interest, keep it in mind. And doing something together. They decide themselves, to a certain extent at least, how they deal with each other. They decide themselves what they actually want to do, although there is a certain framework. But there is something we decide ourselves and we can organize this moment, how we do it. But, and this is the other side of this tension, there is an institution. Any classroom, as any other community, as any other peer group, is part of a larger society. Institutions. A classroom is part of a school, of a university, of something larger. This may differ. We have today actually classrooms without communities. This one being transferred on via internet as mp3 file or something like this. I was recently talking uh, on a conference in a country which I'm actually not allowed to enter, the United States. Um, I had been virtually there via internet visiting the United Nations, taking part in a conference and actively contributing. Something, so you have just an institution, a weird thing, an anonymous thing, which you don't really see, and at the same time it is a new kind of uh, community. It is a new way of controlling each other, uh, in direct ways, simply because somebody could switch off the microphone. 
these are new ways, and it shows, I think, quite well that it is a dialectical tension rather than a contradiction. Of course, some side, one side, may be dominant, the colonization thesis. But at the same time, there is no independence. Institutions always have some notion of community, of direct control as well, as much as uh, communities are always framed by institutions and are never independent, really being able to regulate themselves. If we look at this, there is another dimension to it. We have to look at factors. If people are defining themselves as actors, interacting with each other and with an environment uh, within these two tensions, biographical and societal development, communities and institutions, there must be some conditions, some factors that define this process of um, establishing themselves as actors. <clears throat> what we say is there are three sets of factors. First, conditional factors. Second, constitutional factors. And third, normative factors. Mind, we are back to the norms. I criticized this when I talked about Adam Smith and others. But we are back to the norms. Having said this, you cannot think conditional factors independent of constitutional and normative factors. You cannot think normative factors independent of conditional factors and constitutional factors, and so on and so forth. The decisive moment is we are talking about relationships, relations, and processes. This is actually the exciting thing about societies. Extremely difficult. I have to admit I never understood Einstein's theory of relativity. But societies are even more complex, are more difficult to understand, at least when it comes to a stage that you want to calculate how does A behave in case of 2. A standing for, for a person, 2 the figure for a situation. Nevertheless, it is worthwhile to say these, conditional, the, these factors, we can name some of them that are crucial and we can play at least a little bit around with them, having them as a standard for policy making. Conditional factors are we say socioeconomic security, social cohesion, social inclusion, and social empowerment. Whatever we do, whatever happens in society is depending on people being able, being empowered to act. For this, they need certain socioeconomic conditions. There is nothing going on without a certain material standard. Whatever it is, it is different in different societies, but there is something you need, material resources. And it is about social cohesion, meaning it is about people relating or agreeing on a certain standard, not by a social contract, possibly by a social contract or by treaty, but by their interaction, by the factual cohesion of societies. This means as well, of course, that social cohesion is, uh, social inclusion is important, bringing people in who are otherwise outside. We see this in particular if it comes to uh, migrants, people coming from another country, and we see this as well when it comes to people with disabilities or special um, difficulties. These are important things. I mentioned them not least um, in the context of so uh, social economy. These are very important issues as well to include people into a wider context, people who would be otherwise uh, being left outside. Conditional factors have to be put into place, have to be put into practice. Constitutional factors by action, by 
actually constitute the reality of the actual meaning of these conditional factors. It is about personal human security. We need a certain framework of security that allows us actually to play around with the economic resources or with the socio-economic resources we have. Social recognition, social uh, responsiveness, and uh, personal capacity. Mine, in two cases, we we say personal security and personal capacity. In the other two cases, we say it's about social recognition and social responsiveness. This has to be and is is being further elaborated uh, in this approach, but here we can leave it at this and come to the normative factors. Not independent of these, but by the interaction, by their interaction being again defined. Social justice coming as first, going hand in hand with socioeconomic security and personal security. Social justice is something that is decisive of defining a society. I mentioned on uh, on another case, I am frequently a little bit cynical. Slaves, the ancient societies, the ancient societies had been socially just because slaves had not been considered, as I said cynically, had not been considered as part of society. So you had not been unjust towards them because they had not been part of it. You can only be part, you can only be unjust to somebody or something that is part of what you are talking about. You see this link there going back to inclusion. You cannot think social justice without inclusion. You cannot think inclusion without social justice. And you cannot think about it without having a society that responds. It was Spartacus then who responded and caused turmoil and caused a change of society. Slaves had been considered, uh, or it was the beginning of considering slaves as human beings as citizens. It took a long time and the United States uh, had been the last of the so-called developed countries and we still find slavery uh, and we still find this kind of social uh, injustice. Solidarity is another normative value. can define it in the same way coming out of how people live together and how they constitute themselves. Equal value We usually have these celebrities. We look up to certain people, film stars, and we say, this is great. This is the person, the idol of the time or whatsoever. We find it in arts, in uh, popular arts, in uh, fine arts. You find it in politics. You find it wherever you go. But at the same time, these people are not more valuable than anybody else. This is important when it comes to society and we find it actually accepted by and large when conflicts arise. I read the other day something of a famous director, film director and I don't know why I looked it up. I looked it up and I saw it on a film database. The popularity dropping in one day, or what was it, one week, by 98% due to a crime. These people are not more valuable than others, which means as well, if they do something they should not do, they have to be blamed in the same way. 90%, 98% drop of popularity in something. It means as well that people who are not contributing, completely, fully contributing to what 
we think is the common standard of society, they may contribute in another way. And these are real issues of women, housework in most of the Western societies. Housework is still not fully qualified, fully valued as contribution to society. Voluntary work is not considered to be valuable as much as employed work. All these things are something that are hugely important for every day's life. Equal value. And then, of course, the most difficult, human dignity. Human dignity uh, developing, emerging as well from this process of um, society where people go together, interact together, and depending on conditional and constitutional factors. As I said, we are looking at complex societies, a challenge for any policy, be it economic policy or be it social policy, and we are looking at societies that are hugely differentiated. I'll come back to that later. Just before I end this section, one point which I mentioned implicitly. I said they are important for economic policy and social policy. What we say with the social policy approach is there is no such thing as economic policy. There is no such thing as social policy. There is no such thing as employment policy. I mention these three because this is the orientation of the European Commission, usually saying we have a very strong economic policy, growth-oriented. We have a very important employment policy, and then we have social policy adding to this. What we need, in our view, is a social quality policy that says we are dealing with the social. If we are dealing in the economic area or employment area or any other area, we are dealing with people and their every day's interaction. So we are redefining, if you want, this term of social policy and saying what we actually need is a social quality policy that encapsulates, that embraces all other areas and has to be there as a defining moment, a standard for any other policy. So this is the end of the second section.